I am Dr. Ann Davis, and I am going to take you on an adventure today to an archaeological site, a fascinating archaeological site that is north of Israel. It is a walled Canaanite city, but what we have learned is, is just amazing. Archaeologists have discovered several thousand cuneiform tablets, and uh, these tablets, not only have they learned from artifacts, but they've also learned from these tablets, of not only about the Canaanite culture, but also how the Canaanite culture influenced the people of Israel. And then the language of the people of Ugar, it was similar to Hebrew. So they've been able to, to take some words from the Ugarit and, and then go to the Hebrew where they didn't quite understand the Hebrew word <laughs> and they were able to understand it now that they have the, the, the Ugarit uh, uh, parallel. So um, let's take a look now. I'm going to first start by the discovery of the site of Ugarit. Um, it was discovered in 1928, a Syrian peasant from the local village of Rashamra uh, was digging and he hit something and he kept digging and it turned out to be a tomb. Now, when peasants discover these tombs, uh, they don't tell anybody because they dig and they think there's going to be something valuable that has been buried with a dead person and then they can sell and, and make money from these things. But fortunately, Syria was under control of the French. When the French archaeologists, archaeologists heard about it, they came in and they started excavating from 1929 to 1940. Now they had to stop in 1940 because World War II was starting, but after the war ended, they were able to resume the work. Now what's so fascinating is if you go to Paris today in the Louvre Museum, many artifacts from this archeological site are on display in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Okay, let's take a look at where um, Ugarit is. Okay, first I want to show you where the people of Israel were. This is the period of the judges. This is before the formation of the United Monarchy. It was after the people came into the land of Canaan and they were hugging up into the hill country. Uh, we have, here, here's the uh, trade route that comes from Babylon down to Egypt. And it's along the coast, so it's not going through the hill country. And a lot of Powerful wall cities were built along the trade route, but the people of Israel were up in the <laughs> up in the hill country for protection. Uh, here's Ugarit. It's on the coast of what is today Syria. Now, what we have learned is fascinating. We've learned a lot about the Canaanite culture, their language, their literature. Um, so that's one thing we've learned. But I think even more fascinating is we've learned that. Canaanite culture had a distinct influence on the people of Israel and we're going to see that. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take you into a little uh, snapshot of the history of, of Ugarit. We'll do that with a, uh, a timeline. Archaeologists have discovered um, Stone Age implements all the way back to 5,000 BC. Now this is not the time of Israel. I'll show you in a minute here. Um, the Chalcolithic is, um, is characterized by copper and still not connected with the people of Israel yet. The early Bronze Age, of course, is using bronze, still not connected with the people of Israel. Middle Bronze Age, um, this is some beautiful pottery that came from Cyprus. So the people were, were trading by sea from over it, still not connected with Israel. Now we get the late Bronze Age about 1500 to 1200 BC. This is the time it's connected with the people of Israel. They're moving, they, they've had an exodus from Egypt. They've spent 40 years in wilderness wandering. They've now entered into the promised land. They're hugging up into the hill country. And, and this is the same period of time of, of uh, Ugarit in the late Bronze Age. It's also the, the time the cuneiform tablets date to this period of time, which is really, really important. So what's this, this period of time is, is the time of the judges. Now that the judges, we, this is mas o menos, we say in, in, in Spanish more or less, uh, 1400 to 1000 BC. We, we tend to date um, 1000 is the time when David became king of the United Kingdom and brought the, um, the tribes together. During the period of Judges, 
had been allocated different uh, land. Now they didn't occupy it all. They were up in the hill country, but um, they were in in divided uh, tribal areas. They were not a unified country. They were divided tribal areas. Their life was very simple. The villages were very small. They were in the little valleys up in the hill country. Um, olive trees were uh, grown on, on the hillsides. So this is the period of the judges. And this is the time that the tablets, the cuneiform tablets from Ugarit, date to this period of time. So in the uh, period of the judges, again, we see the people of Israel hugging up into the hill country. There's the trade route coming from Babylon down to Egypt. And that's where all the Canaanite cities were. <laughs> uh, now, Ugarit was destroyed um, in 1200 BC. Um, so there was a period of about two, first 200 years of the time of the judges where these cuneiform tablets are, are going to tell us about that, that early period of the time of the judges. And what you see here is a very simple life. Uh, during this time of the judges, when the tribes were had living in their own separate areas up in the mountains, um, and it was a very difficult way of life. It was a, a very simple, difficult way of life. All right, let's take me take you now to um, to Ugarit. This is a drawing. Ugarit was surrounded by a very powerful wall city. Here's the entrance that was uh, rebuilt <coughs> by the archaeologists. Uh, to show you what the, the entrance to the city would have looked like. Uh, there was a huge um, royal palace area, uh, a building. It's it just huge, took up a large part of the city. There were two temples, uh, the temple to Baal and the temple to Dagan. Now, let me show you about this palace. I was really impressed by that. This is a drawing of what it would have looked like. The palace itself covered three acres. Stop and think about it. Three acres. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it was huge. Furthermore, the, the wall around the palace, now not around the city wall, but the, the wall of the palace was uh, built with finely dressed stones. So these, it wasn't just rocks. The rocks had to be chiseled uh, to be square and, and beautifully dressed stones. I mean, it, it must have been quite a sight to see. Um, there were numerous courtyards within the palace con, uh, uh, con, con, context and also pillared halls. There were smaller palaces outside of the royal palace for lesser figures. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you um, Ugarit. This is Ugarit on the map. Um, you can see the city on, very close to the coast. It's, it was on a river that flew into the Mediterranean and boats could come a very short distance up to the city or, or, or from the city down to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, um, the trade, what archaeologists have discovered, both in, in, in archaeology, but a large part from these cuneiform tablets. Um, well, first, let me show you, there was, um, the trade was coming from overland, from the Hittites to the north. It was coming from ba Babylon. Uh, and the trade goods that, that, that they were trading, they were trading food, wheat, olives, dates, honey, and wine. Uh, they were trading metals, copper, tin, bronze, lead. Now, iron was a very rare metal. It was used for making, um, at, at this time, you know, an iron weapon. Even in the time of, was it Saul or Solomon? I can't remember. Um, only the king had, uh, had an iron weapon. No one else had an iron weapon. Um, so this is the very early period of Israel when iron was, was very scarce. Livestock, horses, donkeys, sheep, and cattle, and logs, of course, that were used for, for construction. Now, in addition to this overland trade, they also had trade by sea. And they have found, archaeologists have found hippopotamus teeth, for heaven's sakes, elephant tusks, glass scales, cosmetics coming from Egypt, baskets. Um, so this was a powerful wall city with, with made powerful by by the tra trade coming from both land and sea. Now there were two temples. Uh, one was the temple to Baal and uh, this is a drawing of, of what it would have looked like originally. You know it's fascinating because it's very simple to the temple of Israel. You see you, you go into the to the the court where the the um, the altar um, 
was located in the, in the open area where they would burn the animals. And you see the smoke coming up from the, from the altar of sacrifice. And then you go into the first part of the temple, which was like the holy place in, in Israel, and then into the Holy of Holies was the, the far back place. So not exactly like Israel, but very similar to Israel. And in fact, the uh, sacrifices were very similar. We can see from the cuneiform tablets that they were burnt offerings, tr trespass offerings, wave offerings, peace offerings, first fruit offerings, new moon offerings, and all these were offerings also in, in Israel. Now, when we take a look at the culture, what's very interesting is the role of the women. Women in Ugarit had an unusual amount of autonomy. They were allowed to own property. They participated in rituals, trained as scribes. If their husband died, they could be the head of the household. Um, and the queens, the Ugarit queens, were actually active in diplomacy um, with, you know, working with um, leaders from other foreign foreign countries. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures, women did not have this kind of authority, but the Hebrew scriptures protect women. The laws in the Hebrew scriptures are very clear to protect women, which was not characteristic in Babylon. Um, now, Ugarit gave women a very high role, however, Women served as priestesses with sexual prom promiscuity at the temple, and of course that did not occur in Israel. So we have some similarities, but not complete similarities. Let's take a look at the Canaanite gods. One of the main gods was Baal, and we read about Baal a lot in the Hebrew scriptures. That was the Canaanite pagan god. And when Moses was bringing the children of Israel up from the from the Sinai and getting ready to enter the promised land, we read that Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. So as they entered the promised land, they were very influenced by the Canaanite culture. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel because you are not allowed to worship Canaanite pagan gods that were having a significant influence on the people of Israel. Another god we see in Ugarit was El. Um, and this is actually a, a, a statue of El from Ugarit. And um, El, of course, sounds like Hebrew. Um, in, in Hebrew, we have El Shaddai, El Elyon, um, El Berit. Um, and these are different gods in Ugarit. All right? They're different gods in Ugarit. Now, in Hebrew, what happened was they took the El and turned it into Elohim, which was the one God. Not different gods of El, but the one God, Elohim. Another interesting God was uh, Dagon, and, and the Philistines worshiped this God. They called it Dagon, but it's the same God. The Philistines worshiped this, this, this God. Okay, one more I'm gonna show you. Asherah was a goddess. She had different names throughout the Near East, but she was known throughout the Near East and was a very popular goddess for the women to worship in Israel because women died of childbirth at a very young age. And um, so the women had these little, this, this by the way was um, found in Israel, but the Asherah was also um, the goddess worshiped in, in Ugarit. And, um, and God had to come in and, and say, no, you can't worship this, this goddess. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. But this Asherah goddess was actually quite popular in Israel. We see this little goddess in many archeological sites in Israel. Now I'm gonna take you to another interesting story that we read about in the cuneiform tablets. That is a war between Yom and Baal. 
Yam with the God of the Sea. Now, the people of Israel did not have a God of the Sea, but the word Yam in Hebrew means sea or ocean. It's the same word, sea or ocean. Now, for Ugarit, Yam was actually a god, all right, the god who lived in the sea. And uh, Yam had a helper who was Leviathan. <laughs> And Leviathan appears in the Hebrew scriptures as this monster that lives in the sea. Now, Mot was the god of the dead. And, of course, um, the people of Israel, well, they had Satan. I guess he was the god of the dead. But the word Mot enters the Hebrew language meaning dead. All right? So there's a lot of connection between the Canaanite culture and the Hebrew culture. Now let's take a look at this war between Yam and and Mot, with Leviathan helping Yam. Yam wanted to be the Lord of the world. Baal said, wait a minute, I want to be the Lord of the world. And there was a war. Baal lost the war and was sent to the underworld. Now the underworld was ruled by Mot, God of the dead, now something happens that I found absolutely fascinating. The sun goddess brings Baal out of the world of the dead at the rising of the sun. And this enters the, the, the Hebrew culture with resurrection, all right, bringing back from the dead. Now, in the, in the Canaanite culture, it was the sun because the sun at, at night it goes down into dark and in the morning it comes up as, as life, um, which is not Hebrew. <laughs> but the concept of being resurre resurrected from dead to life, it actually is in the Hebrew in the form of resurrection. Now another thing that's very interesting is, um, is, is the cult of the dead in Ugarit. Let me show you that. We see in Ugarit these um, Masai bolt they are called. They're, they're standing stones, and 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 they have uh, names of the dead on them. Now the people in Ugarit believed that the dead were in a spirit world, and they could communicate with these dead spirits, and the dead spirits could help them if they and they would they would actually give food to these dead spirits, and uh, to you know please uh, I want to be in your good graces so that you will help me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and we have a you will see the the a Canaanite influence in the Hebrew scriptures because the witch of Endor um, is um, uh, uh, let's see this would have been Saul who depended on the prophet Samuel and Samuel died and Saul didn't have. Samuel to turn to. So we went to the witch of Endor and said, please bring back Saul's spirit. I want to be able to talk to, I mean, Samuel's spirit. I want to be able to talk to Samuel. I need his advice. So the, so the people of Israel were really um, influenced in many ways uh, by the Canaanite culture. Some of it actually entered into the, into the the people of Israel, but many of it, um, God had to work very hard and his leaders had to work very hard to stamp it out, um, the, the pagan influence from the Canaanites. Now I want to talk about this um, uh, Ugarit alphabet. Among all of these cuneiform tablets, tablets there was discovered a library of a scribal school adjoining the, the temple in Ugarit. Um, the dates of these tablets are running from about 1400 to 1200 BC, which is the first is the beginning of the period of the judges in Israel. All right, and they were thousands of cuneiform tablets. Many of them were unknown; they were in an unknown text. They could read the tablets that were Akkadian, or Egyptian, or Hittite, or Sumerian, but then there were quite a few tablets in this language that they didn't know. They finally figured it out. It was an alphabet. And it's the earliest example of alphabet in the ancient world. Now, before this, we thought the Phoenicians 
their alphabet dates earlier than the evidence we have of the Hebrew alphabet. That doesn't mean that the Hebrew alphabet didn't come earlier, but the evidence that we have is the, the Phoenician alphabet is, is earlier than, than the Hebrew alphabet. The Ugarit alphabet is about 200 years earlier than the Phoenicians. So it's the earliest evidence of an alphabet in the history of the ancient Near East. Before the alphabet, things were done with pictures. Hieroglyphs, you see, there's a picture of an eye. Here's a picture of a bird. Uh, now you get the cuneiform in Babylon. Those were also pictures. Uh, there's a picture, I can't remember exactly what it stood for. It had something to do with, uh, with animals, pasturing animals or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But this, is, this you can see is a foot. All right, this you can see is a foot. So before the alphabet, pictures were rendering meaning. But in Ugarit, we have first alphabet writing of the ancient Near East. And this is what it looked like. Ugarit had 27 consonants and three vowels. Hebrew just has 22 consonants. And the Phoenician, by the way, just has 20, 22 consonants. But it, and, and once they could read these tablets, which were in, alpha, in, in alphabet letters, uh, they began to learn a great deal about not only the uh, Ugarit culture and, and language, but also um, uh, connected with the Hebrew. The Ugarit tablets explain Bible passages such as Proverbs 26:23. The word of a whisper, that's the one who you know, mutters uh, rumors and says bad things about people, are like an earthen vessel overlaid with silver lips. Now the parallel line has burning lips, silver lips, earthen vis vessel, wicked heart. So the earthen vessel apparently is, is filled with, with spoiled food. But what is the relationship between silver lips and burning lips? It doesn't make any sense. Well, they found that a Ugarit um, word, the Ugarit language, by the way, is very similar to Hebrew. And so they were able to find the Ugarit word, and it doesn't mean silver lips. It means the, the, the impure material after refining. So you have an ore at very, very high heat, and what's pure stays, and then there's all this junk, sludgy stuff. And that's what, it's not silver lips at, lips at all. It's that silver dross. When you, when you refine silver, you get this junk, this dross. And that's really what it meant. Here's another example, which is interesting. I have found David, my servant, with my sacred oil. I have anointed him, and um, my hand will help him. Really, my arm will strengthen him. Well, there are too many hymns in there, and they all seem to point to David, but they're, don't, they're not pointing to David because this one from the Ugarit word is a young man. And what's important is it refers to us. It's not just David. It's also us. We have been anointed. We are a servant. And if we walk in the ways of God, God will strengthen us and help us. So that, that really makes a whole lot more sense. Now, what happened at the end of Ugarit? People from the north came down into Greece and displaced the, the, those that were already in Greece. They left and came overland and also on sea. And um, they totally destroyed Ugarit. And, and this is the remains of Ugarit. It was not rebuilt after 1200 BC. Now, if, you're, if you've had fun with this one, we have more on BibleInteract.com, our website, BibleInteract.com. You can learn who were the Hittites. Um, and, and this is fascinating. Uh, my husband and I um, visited the archaeological site of the Hittite capital in what is today Turkey. And the Hittites had a great influence on the people of Israel. And so I've done a, a teaching on, on the Hittites. I've also done a teaching on what do we know about Goliath, and this is fascinating because, you know, was there really such a, a such a giant? And I, I love to take a look at the the archaeological evidence that we have, and and I do that in in my teaching about what do we know about Goliath. So go to BibleInteract.com, and we have hundreds and hundreds of teachings, and they're all indexed. So you, if you, whatever you're interested in, if you're interested in Israel's Falls festivals, or you want to know more about Goliath, or you, whatever, whatever you want to learn about, 
you you go to the the index will will take you to the teachings on that particular subject. So with that, I wish you shalom and have fun going to the Bible Interact website to see more of our teachings. Shalom. <laughs>